a TGIF, everyone, and welcome into the First Call Podcast. I'm Jeremy Plunk. He's Jeff Siegel. Each and every week, we take a look at eight stakes races around the country for Saturday or Sunday. Jeff, this isn't one of the biggest Saturdays on the calendar, for sure, especially on the Triple Crown Trail. It's void of any big three-year-old preps uh, going long, at least. Yeah, it's the last week before uh, the real stuff starts. Let's put it that way. I mean, there's still some good racing and maybe good gambling as well. Um, but uh, next week and then continuing out through the Triple Crown and into, uh, you know, Saratoga, Del Mar. I mean, it, it's going to be nonstop, really top, mm-hmm. top racing. This one, um, I, I, as you mentioned, uh, no real key preps for the Derby and the Triple Crown, but uh, that uh, that ends uh, beginning next week and then throughout the long run. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll handle it. We'll find something that's worthwhile. I'm sure good racing at Laurel and um, enjoying that. And uh, a few other uh, tracks uh, have some nice races as well. Good veteran sprinters in action this weekend. So if you like the Breeders' Cup Sprint Division, this is a good weekend to sink your teeth into. For the benefit of those of you watching on YouTube or on Twitter, be sure to reshare this and uh, hit the like button, get our audience built up for us. And for those of you listening on our traditional audio podcast channels, here are the eight races that Jeff Siegel and I will handicap over the next oh, 30 minutes or so. From Laurel Park, they've got three stakes races on Saturday. We will take a look at the final two of those, the Caniver Stakes and the Harrison E. Johnson Memorial. From Gulfstream Park, there are some three-year-olds in action in the sprint ranks, the Hutchison Stakes at Gulfstream. To Oaklawn Park, we'll go for the Purple Martin and the Whitmore. Of course, we name a race after Whitmore. It's got to be a sprint on the dirt. We'll take a look at that one. At Santa Anita, stakes races there include the Pasadena for the three-year-olds on the turf and the San Carlos for the older sprint division. And at Turfway, nobody knows where Kate Middleton is in the world right now. She's missing in action, but we know where the Queen is. It's Turfway <laughs> Park coming up on Saturday night with the Queen Stakes. Tournament players, we've got a trio of feeder tournaments for you each day, uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at Gulfstream Park and also at Santa Anita. Win your way into some bigger, big money tournament berths later in the season by playing this weekend no major tournaments at express bet this weekend because it's the national horse players championship in las vegas where jeff siegel is right now uh so a lot of our tournament players good luck to you playing in the nhc this weekend in vegas we do have an exactathon back for twenty five thousand dollars this saturday at tampa bay downs we know last week things didn't go quite right at the end of the day at tampa bay downs as far as all of the tote and all the systems that uh, failed so we're running back the twenty five thousand dollar tampa bay downs exactathon so if you can hit exact as in six of the nine races on Saturday at Tampa Bay Downs, you win your share of $20,000. And the player who hits the most exact is on the card will win their share of 5000 with the other players who also hit that highest amount. So be sure to play Tampa Bay Downs this Saturday. And when you do, do so with Express Bet and First Bet. Be sure to opt into the promos. You always want to do that. So you're playing $2 exact minimums in the exactathon. So get after that. Maybe you can win up to $25,000. Certainly uh, some big boosts going into the... Uh, uh, into the accounts of players uh, over over the port, uh, course of the last several weeks. And last week, just to let you know, folks, if you played in that exactathon, they did a really good job. I'll give the marketing team at Express Bet uh, a thumbs up and first bet for this one. If you had four winners, we know the requirement is to hit winners in six exactas during the course of the card. If you had four when the last two races were considered non-wagering events at that point, they went ahead and gave you credit for hitting six. Given the assumption to the horse player that you were going to take down that fifth and sixth and get up over the threshold. So uh, congrats, players who had four got a certain amount in their accounts put back in the exactathon. Those who hit five got another amount. Those who hit six got another amount. But I thought it was a good way to pay down on that unfortunate day uh, at Tampa Bay Downs. Okay, Jeff, let's get handicapping on this uh, card for Saturday as we start at Laurel Park. Again, we told you three stakes on the program. There'll be races seven, eight, and nine at Laurel. The Not for Love stakes is race number seven. We're going to start with the Conniver in race number eight. This is the Philly and Mare version of the Not for Love. That one is seven furlong sprint for the Maryland Bred Boys. This one for the ladies here. Who do you like in race number eight at Laurel? Golden Tabby uh, is a, a tough mare. Um, she used to be cheap, and now she's really not only genuine very consistent rising speed figures for high percentage trainer jamie ness and in this seven furlong sprint the pace scenario looks very modest for her i think golden tabby uh should be able to be on or near the lead uh without really uh spending much energy in doing so um i I tend to be a little hesitant with the with the park speed figures they tend to be a little bit inflated right um but 
um, given the pace scenario and the connections and the, and the consistency, um, nine wins and 18 starts with five seconds. She just lays it on the line every time. Uh, I think she's going to be able to uh, handle this task, especially when you consider the trip she's going to get. So at nine to five in the morning line, I think Golden Tabby, I don't know, maybe she'll go lower, maybe not. Um, mm -hmm. But whatever the case is, I think she's the right horse in the Conniver. Interesting to see what my flicker has to offer in here. She was claimed the six year old mare claim for 55,000 last time mm -hmm. out. Brittany yeah, Russell picks that one up for the Elkstone group and has been running an open company. Again, this is a restricted race did run in the conniver stakes last year, ran sixth at 12 to one back with Anthony Ferrier then, but it's been two barns since then. Linda Goddad had this runner and now Brittany Russell, she seems to move everything up. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if my flicker has a big effort to offer seven furlongs from the rail, plenty of time to get out of there. And so not a horse with a a ton of early speed, but Sheldon Russell Bill will be uh, tasked with working out the trip uh, in that one. That's race number eight at Laurel Park, and we move next to the ninth on the card at Laurel, which will be the Harrison E. Johnson Memorial. It's our express bet race of the week. You can check out my full analysis of this race each and every week with the express bet race of the week sent to your email inbox go to first bet or express bet sign up for the weekly newsletter get on our mailing list and we'll send that out to you each week one turn mile which means jeff they use the second finish line here at laurel park so a long run home once they turn in we've got a horse in here who's the defending champ in the race and that's nimitz class won it so easily last year by six and a quarter lengths is he the repeat victor that we're looking for or are we shopping somewhere else now, I went with Nimitz class. I'm, I'm going to hope that he's the same horse now that he was then. Mm -hmm. And while his recent form, uh, disappointing, I mean, you look at the comp the, uh, the company he was trying to keep there, Pegasus World Cup Invitational, mm -hmm. and then the General George and below form in those races. But uh, this race um, looks to be well within his range, obviously, if he's still got something left. He's He's always been a pro, 11 out of 23. He knows how to win races, loves yeah. Laurel, as you pointed out, the defending champion. Pace scenario does not look particularly intense in this one-turn no. mile. I, I mean, he's not normally a front runner, but when he's able to make the lead or press a moderate pace, all of a sudden he turns into a monster, and I think mm -hmm. that's that's going to bring out his best. So if you've got anything left, uh, and good, good hands, George Weaver, I think Nimitz class should outclass this field. And he's eight to five in the morning line for a reason. Yeah, I agree with you. I think he's the horse to beat in here on top. You want to work some exactas underneath, perhaps. Uh, I think he could have a, a performance like he did last year, where he sat right up near a very slow pace, 24 and change for a one third mile. And this race doesn't look that fast. And like you said, when he gets to run like that, he's awfully tough. If he draws off and wins easy, then you're looking for a horse from far back, maybe to kind of pick up the pieces because blowout winners tend to gut everybody who chases them. So I thought Shaft's Bullet, the one was a horse who could come from well off of it. It's sizzling time. Another one a deep closer in here maybe horses who could have a little bit of shot in here in terms of the exactness so that's the express bet race of the week the harrison e johnson memorial uh named for a former trainer on the maryland circuit who passed away in a plane crash back in the 1970s but a popular trainer there who had some good horses uh, back in the day we go next to Gulfstream park on saturday it's the hutchison stakes this race used to be one of the first legs of the season that got you kind of tuned up towards a potential triple crown race, a prep to the swale. Uh, then the swale was a prep to the fountain of youth in Florida Derby. Nobody runs that often anymore. So the Hutchison had to find kind of a new purpose. It's a listed six furlong, hundred thousand dollar stakes. Uh, now you really don't get the triple crown nominees in this field anymore of the field of seven. None of them have been nominated to this year's triple crown. Hutchison stakes is race number three on the card. So it'll be early in the day at Gulfstream park. Uh, Jeff, how do you see it shaking out? Yeah, I remember when the Hutchinson was a really critical coming out party for <laughs> newly turned three year olds, and yeah. a lot of them um, were coming off layoffs. They had shown promise. Uh, this is before the Breeders' Cup, so a lot of them were being put away for the winter. Mm -hmm. They used to do that a lot, putting horses away for the winter. You know, imagine and they bring them back, and uh, not quite the same race as so many stakes races are now around the country different than they used to be but the names it's a good name i like hutchinson it used to mm -hmm. be an important race that horse i'm very intrigued by him now you remember his race in the british cup juvenile turf sprint yeah i don't know if i've seen a horse make up that kind of ground in, in such a short period of time as he did he was 10th inside the furlong pole <laughs> got beat a half length by a very good horse and was just flying they brought him back in the winter and i think uh what um Jorge Delgado wanted to find out is whether he could have a dirt horse 
So he actually entered him in a dirt race. I think it was in January sometime. Anyway, he was in the race and he had fractures in the gate and got scratched. So that was put mm-hmm. off. Then he comes back in an allowance race and he was given a lot too much to do, had some trouble in the turn, flew home, ran really well. Mm-hmm. We'll take a look at that tape in a bit. But uh, now he's back on the dirt, which was the original plan like two months ago. So right. see if he can handle it. I, I haven't seen his workouts, but I can tell you that I'm looking at those times, 46 and 1, 47 2. It looks like he's he's handling it just fine. So yeah. you know, I don't know. He's seven to five in the morning line. I'm not sure there's a gamble here, but if that force is going to be a force. And being by Malibu Moon out of a quality road mare, why wouldn't he like the dirt? Um, sure. I'm going to be very interested to see how he performs here, much more than maybe gambling on him, because I think he has a chance to be a, a force in his division. Not often do we see Royal Ascot winners, the winner of the Group 2 Norfolk running into Hutchison Stakes. So this is a bit of a treat. Let's take a look at his tune-up last time. As Jeff said, he had too much to do at the top of the lane, almost got there in allowance company. As they race for home. Up front, it's still Esper on the target, off the turn on top by three. Loose now is Valiant Force, but his back's against the wall as Reef Runner takes aim from second. Down the center in a late run from Mackville. There's a 16th to run. Reef Runner surging forward now to take the lead. It's Reef Runner close to home. Valiant Force is motoring, but out of time. Reef Runner wins. Reef Runner for the money, close then for second. Probably Valiant Force catching Esperon. Change of rider to David Egan. Egan will take the mount on Valiant Force this time, replacing Irad Ortiz. I don't know if that's a plus or minus move at Gulfstream as you're going from surf to dirt, losing Irad and picking up uh, David Egan. But uh, that's the way it's going to shake out on Saturday. Uh, no Irad Ortiz in the Hutchison Stakes. Valiant Force piloted by uh, David Egan. Let's go next to... Oaklawn Park, where they've got a couple sprint stakes races for you. We've got three-year-old fillies in the Purple Martin, and we've got the older males in the Whitmore Stakes, one of the top sprints of the meet at Oaklawn Park, all tuning up towards the Count Fleet at the end of the season. Purple Martin, though, three-year-old fillies first up here. These fillies maybe could find their way to the fantasy stakes by the end of the meet if they want to stretch out in trip. But for now, we're looking at them as six furlong specialists, Jeff. And who out sprints whom in this particular event? Yeah, it's a tough race. I went up and down uh, several times trying to find one that I liked. Ended up with a Sternia, but not a lot of confidence in her. Um, <laughs> she's maybe the quickest and in the race that may lack an effective closer maybe she can hang on here i also looked at brooklyn drew the maiden winner uh last time out easy winner and actually she got the top fig in the race but that was an off the turfer uh it was only five and a half she got loose early and i just don't know whether that race flatters her or not i it mm-hmm. might and whereas Esterney is drawn outside that's that should be good um i don't know whether she can stalk and go she looks like maybe she's want, gonna want to get up then I looked at Extreme right. Diva. That seemed logical to me. Watched her tape last time. And, wow, you talk about making hard work of it with a good <laughs> trip. I, I couldn't better back off that all-out win. So I'm at a loss here. I mean, I ended up with a Sternium. I liked her her last race. But uh, you could talk me into anything here, Jeremy, if you had an opinion. Well, it's a smallish field, especially for Oakland, right? We're not used to seeing six-horse fields, but a six-horse sprint in here, uh, the trip should not be an issue, and this field should spread a little bit because, like you said, Asterny has got speed in here. But I like the smaller field size. I like to favor the horses with front-running speed in these particular races. You know, there's not as many challenges to come at them. They don't come in waves, and Asterny, I think, will get clear, and uh, I think she'll be the one to beat. If she can out-sprint Brooklyn Drew, the filly coming in, uh, the Army Mule filly coming in off the win at uh, Fairgrounds last time. Time. That seems to be the only other one who could kind of warm her up early in the race. Asturnia, two, uh, in her last start, was two starts back for Extreme Diva when they met up. And then Extreme Diva came back to win that race, as you said, made hard work of it in the Dixie Bell. But at least Frank, the form of that allowance rank, uh, race from February 2nd. Yeah. We're going to give the fans a chance to go back and look at that when Extreme Diva was able to run down Asturnia in that one. Now Asturnia gets to come in fresh, and that could be the key factor on yeah. Saturday. Let's go back. Asternia strings them out. Went quickly. 21-3 and three that first quarter. Moving right along as she hits the quarter pull. Extreme Diva picks up the running in the second spot. Dubois Blanc is third under a hard ride. Copper M next with our keepsake. The others are well behind as they come down the lane. Extreme Diva on the outside trying to reel in Asternia who has a final furlong to go. Extreme Diva and Eduardo Gallardo on the outside inside Asternia and Manny Escavel. Extreme Diva gradually getting to that early leader Asturnia and Extreme Divas going to pull it off at 11 to 1. 
Next up at Oaklawn, the ninth race on the card Saturday is the Grade 3 Whitmore. $250,000, six furlong sprint. Ron Moquette, the trainer of Whitmore, is represented in this one. He's got the one, Osborne. Now, this is a familiar cast of horses we've seen at Oaklawn and around the country. Cowan coming in, Jackson Traveler, horses that have been uh, longtime stakes runners, and Teano Twist. He's a horse who's been good at Oaklawn over the years, no question about it. And he may have been as good as he's ever been uh, when he won the Ring the Bell stakes early earlier this meet. He's trying to get outside, but Tejano Twist is on the move at the top of the lane. Sir Wellington in the white blaze. He's got a narrow lead. Rivet struggling inside of him. And Tejano Twist and Chris Landeros roaring from the back of the field, taking the lead and drawing clear for an emphatic win in the ring the bell stakes. Tejano Twist, he's back at Oakland and he's made a statement today. That race was followed up with a good second last time out behind Skelly, a horse who was, what, six, seven wins in a row for Steve Asmussen before heading over to Saudi Arabia and running a good one. So uh, Tejano Twist, he loves Oakland, Jeff. He's in really good form right now. He really is, and he's so dependable. Um, he won two in a row prior to getting beat in the King Cotton, but Skelly, who beat him, was on a massive win streak. And is as much as Tejano Twist is a specialist at Oakland. So is Skelly. And when Skelly beat him, it was a sloppy track, and it might have been a little bit more difficult uh, for Tohano Twist, who has no history of winning on an off track. So I think, I don't know what weather is going to have at Oakland. I mean, it, 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 no matter what they tell you it's going to be, it'll be different. So right. um, I, I just have a hunch that um, Tejano Twist is uh, going to bounce back and, and run huge here. And um, the race that we just saw, the Ring the Bell, uh, that's good enough to beat this field. So, uh, you know, he's for, never off the board in six starts at Oakland with three wins in two seconds. And uh, Jock knows him well. So uh, let's expect the Hano Twist to show up with his A game. And that's good enough to win. I think surveillance is a horse to look at, too, underneath. Uh, he might get a head start a little bit on Teano Twist in terms of closing, but I'm curious to see how that Fairgrounds form holds up. And 109 and change at Fairgrounds is motoring. Uh, good effort last time in Allowance Company for Keith DeSormo. The horse did race here at Oaklawn in the past and ran a solid fourth in the Count Fleet last year coming from off the pace. Again, beaten by Skelly, strobe some really good horses in that particular spot. He just finished three-quarters of a length behind Teano Twist in that one. So looking for an exact Teano Twist over surveillance. I'm going to take that one uh, to the bank in race number nine at Oaklawn Park, that being the Whitmore Stakes. All right, Jeff, that's Santa Anita in your backyard. You'll be back home for this one. I know you're heading back from Las Vegas in time for uh, Saturday's races, the Pasadena Stakes next up for us. Uh, race number three at Santa Anita will be a one-mile turf race for the three-year-olds. We do have one Triple Crown nominee in here, Lord Bullingdon. Could this horse potential for Michael McCarthy make his way to the Santa Anita Derby? Time's getting tight, so if you're running in this race, chances are not, but maybe a Preakness horse. Uh, we don't know. We're at least Triple Crown nominated, and that get you a little bit excited about a three-year-old more so when they don't have that insignia next to their name in the pps well one thing i notice about michael mccarthy he's a good trainer obviously but he doesn't doesn't do anything outlandish you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. and i think now that he's figured out that this colt's probably what he is which is a nice you know listed type of middle distance turf horse i mm -hmm. think he's going to allow lord bullington to to do what he does best which is why he hasn't been out since december 29th when he won a very similar race the eddie logan uh, over right. the same course and distance. And he's had a very healthy work pattern since then. So I think the the idea was to, okay, we, you know, we had a pretty busy uh, fall. Let's sort of win this race and then give him a breather for a couple of months and maybe send him back to Keeneland and see if we can win some of those middle distance races there. He's not particularly brilliant or fast on numbers, but Lord Bullington is a pro. Uh, he didn't run as well as I thought he would run two races back at Delmar when he got beat by Stay Hot, who's in this race as well. But he didn't get a good trip that day, which is one of the reasons why I liked him in the Eddie Logan, and he won mm -hmm. that race stylishly. So I have him on top. I was really wanting to pick Island Cruiser. He's got that great stretch out angle. Uh, he's he's developing nicely. Um, uh, he won sprinting on the lead. He was strong in the race. I don't think he beat a whole lot. Uh, got mm -hmm. a soft trip. But um, you know, if he gets loose in the lead and they don't respect him, Island Cruiser first time around two turns for Sadler. It's going to take this field a really long way. And in a race mm -hmm. that has no other speed, he's going to be gifted that kind of trip. So I had a hard time picking the two. I think that's the exact one way or the other. Okay. I ended up with Lord Bullington over Island Cruiser. But if Island Cruiser isn't pressured, 
he uh, he's going to be tough to catch. Let's take a look at Lord Bullington at his best in the Eddie Logan. Past the quarter pole and turning for home. And charge for gold still there. Miracle mark up to engage in second. Charge for gold digging in. There's room for Lord Bullington. What a sweet trip he's at. And he comes to take the lead at the 16th pole. And it's Lord Bullington pulling clear under Umberto Rispoli to win the Eddie Logan by two and a half decisive lengths. Not a huge field here in the Pasadena, but you got quality. Jonathan Thomas bringing in a really well-bred Uncle Truly from the East Coast. You've got Stay Hot, a two-time stakes winner in his last two starts. Guy named Joe for Doug O'Neill coming off a third in the El Camino Real Derby. Maybe this will tell you a little bit more about Endlessly, the horse for Michael McCarthy, who won uh, the El Camino Real. And, of course, McCarthy's got Lord Bullington in there. And Island Cruiser could just be the one to catch, as you said, stretching out off that downhill sprint for John Sadler. Sadler should know this one by Catalina Cruz. Cruiser, right? I mean, second generation coming out of his barn. Catalina Cruiser was outstanding uh, for uh, John Sadler in the day. Next up, we go back to Santa Anita for the feature race on the card Saturday. It's the grade three San Carlos stakes, $100,000 for the sprinters in this race, a field of seven. And when you talk California based sprinters, Jeff, the conversation for me starts with the cowbred, the chosen Ron. I know he's against open company in here, but he has run well against open company in the past. And he is just so, so good right now. Really is. And I talk about, I mentioned how, how well Michael McCarthy does managing his stock. Well, Eric Kuljak is, should be an eclipse award. for the chosen <laughs> Ron. Just the way he's kept this gelding uh, in form. How about this? 15 wins and 20 starts. You Not never bad. really asked him to do anything that he can't do. You talk about tack tackling older company, even though it, you know he just plays with cowbreds. And as a gelding, you want to keep him along or, or, or around as long as you can. Um, he did win the grade one Bing Crosby uh, at Del Mar, so it's not like stepping out of his comfort zone is going to bother him. And mm -hmm. seven-eighths of a, dis a distance allows him to uh, overcome the rail, won't have to be rushed. He can kind of you know, get out of there and find a spot. Uh, his last race against uh, the Cal Cup sprint was terrific, and um, you know he continues to shine. So at three to five on the morning line and likely to go lower, um, there's not much gamble here other than the fact that you go out and enjoy a very, very popular horse. I mean, he is he is about as popular as it gets because we know him so well, and he, he's mm -hmm. so consistent. Elwood Blues, I think, the lightly raced Bob Baffert Colt, who's drawn right on side, on side, is a logical, uh, exact partner uh, if mm -hmm. you want to try to make a little bit more money. He's improving. Numbers-wise, he's not close to the chosen Ron yet, but he's getting better. And as mm -hmm. a justified Colt, who knows what his ceiling is going to be? Just five starts, three wins in two seconds. I think he's going to run great, but great might not be good enough to beat the chosen Ron. Chosen Vron has gone wire to wire sometimes, stalks a little bit, and then pounces from the rail with Elwood Blues to his outside. You think Hector Barrios sends him to the lead? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, I don't think anybody's really going to send hard going seven, eight, such a long run. Right. Uh, from the start to the far turn, so you can kind of get a position. But I wouldn't take anybody back here, I can tell you that. Yeah. Because uh, I don't think the pace scenario is going to be intense. But Again, if if the chosen Ron breaks running and he's able to make the lead, then he's just going to toy them. Um, right. But if, I don't think they're going to take him back either. But he won't have to go fast to be wherever he wants to be. Hector Barrios riding Island Cruiser, who's probably going to be on the lead in the previous stakes. We talked about the Pasadena. He might be the Incredible Hulk on Saturday, the way he's feeling, uh, riding those two horses who could be on the lead. The chosen Braun, last time out, looked just as good as ever. Down at the rail, needs to get going from there. As Brickyard Ride turns for home with a two-length lead, the chosen Braun now angles out, and these two hook up at the eighth pole. Brickyard Ride, the chosen Braun, though, just ambles up to him, and the chosen Braun simply in invincible as he will cruise once again he's now 15 for 20 what an amazing gelding the chosen Vron is and we'll go from the san carlos stakes at santa anita to the nighttime card at turfway and saturday night's feature will be race number six on the card the Philly Amare Sprinters going in this one at six furlongs. The Queen Stakes, $125,000. And it's Turfway Park, so you know you're going to need a lot of ink and a lot of pages when you print this one out. Field of 12, 13 with the also eligible. Another big field and a great handicapping challenge at Turfway Park. Uh, they're just a week away from their big race, the Jeff Ruby, coming up a week from Saturday, Jeff. So let's see how a 
tune up with the Queen Stakes on Saturday night. Who do you like? Well, I, I think a lot of people will look at BG Warrior and expect that even though she was very impressive and dominant in her most recent win, the Wishing Well, um, she has a history of running really well and then firing and falling back the next time. Mm -hmm. Um, bouncing is what they call it, or they mm -hmm. used to call it. I don't know. Anyway, um, but BG Warrior's last race was just very impressive, going six and a half. She's backing um, back to six here, and she's clearly the quickest of the quick here. And I like the fact that um, even though she ran a hard, fast race with a fast number uh, last time out, uh, she's been giving enough, been given enough time off. Maybe this is uh, the plan now with her: is if she runs hard, you know, give her a couple of months to recover. Um, and she, they've barely worked her out. So, I mean, she's going to fire fresh if she's going to fire at all. And her last race, um, good enough to outrun this group if she runs back to it. And mm -hmm. I hope that she can. A couple of California turf sprinters come in east for this one. You got Princess Adelaide transferred from Vladimir Sarin to Phil D'Amato's barn, a horse who had won the uh, run third in the Daisy Cutter at Del Mar last summer. Another uh, Del Mar Stakes horse, uh, horse Honey Pants, has most recently run uh, January twenty what uh, January fourteenth and went right. into Las Cienegas under Frankie Dettori at Santa Anita. That one transferred D'Amato to Jonathan Thomas for this race. So a little Southern California influence here. I would assume that they are going to match up well with Eastern speed. I mean, that West coast speed is what we know Santa Anita for, right? I mean, in the Southern California turf sprinters, uh, I would think they're going to be plenty quick here. It's a matter of whether they take to the footing or not. Not all turf horses like the synthetic, not all synthetic horses like the turf. So there is some adjustment period for them to see how they handle it. Princess Adelaide, the eight in here, did win over the Tapita at Golden Gate Fields, if you're looking for any kind of comparison there. And Honey Pants has run okay over the synth down at Gulfstream Park, running on the Tapita, running a decent second there. So mm -hmm. I think their form will transfer. I think their quality of speed will transfer. Will the footing transfer? Probably based on the past performances, they both have to be contenders in here. Yeah, Honey Pants won uh, the uh, La Cienegas and won nicely, although she did have the benefit of a ground saving trip, and that's six and a half down the hill, not six furlongs. And she, she's not the kind of mare you want to rush. Uh, she's going to mm -hmm. have to fall out of there and then make a run. And from the 12 hole, I just, it's hard for me to envision the kind of trip she's going to get from out there, completely opposite of what she had done in the La Cienegas. Um, but on pure numbers, she's good enough to win. So if she can work out a trip, uh, then uh, she might be hurt from late. Princess Adelaide, again, a, a locally uh, raced horse here, has more tactical speed than Honey Pants. And she might actually draft in and be stalking PG Warrior. I don't think she's as quick as PG Warrior, uh, BG Warrior is. But she is thrown outside. So she can kind of fall out of there and stalk, pounce, and go. Um, she's essentially a horse who wants to be in front. I'm not sure she can do that, but if BG Warrior kind of gives it up, Princess Adelaide is, to use a harness turn, first over. And uh, I think that she's got a very good chance uh, uh, for Phil D'Amato to, uh, you know, to be right there. So it's an interesting race, as all these turfway races are, because, again, you mentioned it. It's turfway. You're going to get big fields. you got some options. Yeah. You know, it's not just... Uh, you know, you, you contrast that with the chosen Vaughn out here in California. I'd love to see him run, but from a gambling standpoint, not much you can do with it. But here, right. you, you can sink your teeth into it if you want to. PG Warrior was impressive last time. Didn't give it up then in the wishing well. Let's take a look back. Six stage. Then Baby No Worries striding into the fourth spot. And Secret Operations into the fifth position. But BG Warriors running a big one this evening. She's all alone near the eighth pole. Ravella's second with Marissa's lady. Baby No Worries is picking up her best stride to the far outside. But BG Warrior meant business from the very beginning. Look at BG Warrior, a powerful gate-to-wire winner in the Wishing Well Stakes. Baby No Worries up for second. So we'll see if BG Warrior can do it again. That's the Queen Stakes at Turfway Park. And a reminder again, next week, the following Saturday, the big one, the Jeff Ruby Stakes Day card at Turfway Park. Also next Saturday, it'll be Louisiana Derby Day at the fairgrounds. Louisiana Derby will draw this Saturday. I believe they're drawing Saturday as well for uh, the Jeff Ruby Stakes. So a couple big post-position draws to follow this weekend for next week's Triple Crown Trail. We'll have all of that action for you. Uh, previewed and reviewed and any way you can slice it on our podcast here. Of course, Jeff and I have our Tuesday podcast. It's official where we'll review this weekend stakes and then look ahead to those big triple crown races as well. $25,000 exact-a-thon this Saturday at uh, 
at uh, Tampa Bay Downs. So if you can hit six exactas, you got to hit exactas in six of the nine races on the card. It's a truncated card. You still got to hit six. So it's going to be tough. But if you pull it off, that bonus is going to be even bigger. Fewer people are going to hit it on a nine race card with six exactas. So that $20,000 you're going to split is going to be up there. So be sure to play this weekend. Make sure you register $2 minimums. No $1 exactas in exactathon. Want to stress that so uh, be sure to play this weekend twenty five thousand dollar Tampa Bay Downs Exactathon and also when you play the Coast to Coast Pick Five this weekend be sure to do so with Express Bet and First Bet where you get ten times wager rewards points the Coast to Coast Pick Five races this Saturday uh, from Gulfstream and Santa Anita line up this way at Gulfstream Park it'll be races 10 and 12 at Santa Anita races 5 6 and 7 so Gulfstream 10 and 12 Santa Anita 5 6 and 7 those are your coast to coast pick 5 races for this Saturday coast to coast also runs back on Sunday as well every Saturday and Sunday low takeout just 15% on the $1 minimum wager Okay, Jeff, that's going to wrap things up. I know you're done covering the Pac-12 tournament. Your Bruins came up just a hair short yesterday in a good effort, but you got to leave the hardwood and the bouncing balls and get back to the racetrack. We need you in Southern California. Looking forward to it. No March Madness for me this year. That's fine. I can I can handle it. So I'll be back uh, driving home. I, I, it's a good thing that I came up here because it was very, very windy uh, where I live, uh, and I uh, understand my power has been out for the last day or so, which is <laughs> difficult. I mean, so I didn't have to deal with that. I'm glad I'm here. Glad I'm coming home, and uh, I'll be at Santa Anita uh, tomorrow. And I got to say, for hotel Wi-Fi, you held on really well here. That's not the, usually the norm, so excellent job. No, you're job, right about uh, that. By your host. I'm amazed. I, I'm, I'm thrilled. I, I, I think we better uh say goodbye before we that that uh <laughs> comes back and bites us so uh anyway good uh good good weekend ahead and uh we'll be uh covering it uh and looking back and it's certainly looking forward to uh what's going to happen next week uh on our call uh on our, our podcast um it's official on tuesday all right buddy have a safe drive home on behalf of everybody with first technologies my partner jeff siegel i'm jerry plunk have a great weekend out there horse players and good luck to those of you playing in the nhc